Fathers and Sons by Ivan Turgenev Chapter 19 In spite of her masterly self-control and superiority to every kind of prejudice, Madame Odinstov felt awkward when she entered the dining room for dinner. However, the meal went off quite satisfactorily. Porfiry Platonich turned up and told various anecdotes. He had just returned from the town. Among other things, he announced that the governor had ordered his secretaries on special commissions to wear spurs in case he might want to send them off somewhere on horseback at greater speed. Arkady talked in an undertone to Katya and attended diplomatically to the princess. Bazarov maintained a grim and obstinate silence. Madame Odinstov glanced at him twice, not furtively, but straight in his face, which looked stern and choleric, with downcast eyes and a contemptuous determination stamped on every feature, and she thought, No, no, no. After dinner she went with the whole company into the garden, and seeing that Bazarov wanted to speak to her, she walked a few steps to one side and stopped. He approached her, but even then he did not raise his eyes, and said in a husky voice, "'I have to apologize to you, Anna Sergeyevna. You must be furious with me.' "'No, I'm not angry with you, Evgeny Vasilich, but I'm upset.' "'So much the worse. In any case, I've been punished enough. I find myself, I'm sure you will agree, in a very stupid position.' You wrote to me, why go away? But I can't stay, and I don't want to. Tomorrow I shall no longer be here. Evgeny Vasilich, why are you... Why am I going away? No, I didn't mean that. The past won't return, Anna Sergeyevna, but sooner or later this was bound to happen. Therefore I must go. I can imagine only one condition which would have enabled me to stay, but that condition will never be. For surely, excuse my impudence, you don't love me and never will love me." Bazarov's eyes glittered for a moment from under his dark brows. Anna Sergeyevna did not answer him. "'I'm afraid of this man,' was the thought that flashed through her mind. Farewell, then, muttered Bazarov, as if he guessed her thought, and he turned back to the house. Anna Sergeyevna followed him slowly, and calling Katya to her, she took her arm. She kept Katya by her side till the evening. She did not play cards, and kept on laughing, which was not at all in keeping with her pale and worried face. Arkady was perplexed, and looked at her, as young people do, constantly wondering, what can it mean? Bazarov shut himself up in his room, and only reappeared at tea-time. Anna Sergeyevna wanted to say a kind word to him, but she could not bring herself to address him. An unexpected incident rescued her from her embarrassment. The butler announced the arrival of Sitnikov. Words can hardly describe the strange figure cut by the young champion of progress as he fluttered into the room. He had decided with his characteristic impudence to go to the country to visit a woman whom he hardly knew, who had never invited him, but with whom, as he had ascertained, such talented people and intimate friends of his were staying. Nevertheless, he was trembling to the marrow of his bones with fright and instead of bringing out the excuses and compliments which he had learned by heart beforehand, he muttered something idiotic about Evdoskia Kuchina having sent him to inquire after Anna Sergeyevna's health, and that Arkady Nikolaevich had always spoken to him in terms of the highest praise. At this point he faltered and lost his presence of mind so completely that he sat down on his hat. However, since no one turned him out, and Anna Sergeyevna even introduced him to her aunt and sister, he soon recovered himself and began to chatter to his heart's content. The introduction of something commonplace is often useful in life. It relieves an overstrained tension, 
and sobers down self-confident or self-sacrificing feelings by recalling how closely it is related to them. With Sitnikov's appearance, everything became somehow duller, more trivial, and easier. They all even ate supper with a better appetite, and went to bed half an hour earlier than usual. "'I can now repeat to you,' said Arkady, as he lay down in bed, to Bazarov, who was also undressing, "'what you once said to me. Why are you so melancholy? It looks as though you were fulfilling some sacred duty.' For some time past, a tone of artificially free and easy banter had sprung up between the two young men, always a sure sign of secret dissatisfaction or of unexpressed suspicion. "'I'm going to my father's place tomorrow," said Bazarov. Arkady raised himself and leaned on his elbow. He felt both surprised and somehow pleased. "'Ah!' he remarked. "'And is that why you are sad?' Bazarov yawned. "'If you know too much, you grow old.' "'And what about Anna Sergeyevna?' "'What about her? I mean, will she let you go?' "'I'm not in her employment.' Arkady became thoughtful while Bazarov lay down and turned his face to the wall. Some minutes passed in silence. "'Evgeny!' suddenly exclaimed Arkady. "'Well? I shall also leave tomorrow.' Bazarov made no answer. "'Only I shall go home,' continued Arkady. "'We will go together as far as Koklovsky, and there you can get horses at Fedos. I should have been delighted to meet your people, but I'm afraid I should only get in their way and yours. Of course you're coming back to stay with us.' "'I've left all my things with you,' said Bazarov, without turning around. "'Why doesn't he ask me why I'm going away? "'And just as suddenly as he is,' thought Arkady. "'As a matter of fact, why am I going, and why is he?' he went on reflecting. He could find no satisfactory answer to his own question, though his heart was filled with some bitter feeling. He felt he would find it hard to part from this life to which he had grown so accustomed. But for him to stay on alone would also be queer. Something has happened between them, he reasoned to himself. What's the good of my hanging around here after he has gone? Obviously I should bore her stiff and lose even the little that remains for me. He began to conjure up a picture of Anna Sergeyevna. Then other features gradually eclipsed the lovely image of the young widow. "'I'm sorry about Katya, too,' Arkady whispered to his pillow, on which a tear had already fallen. Suddenly he shook back his hair and said aloud, "'What the devil brought that idiotic Sitnikov here?' Bazarov started to move about in his bed and then made the following answer. I see you're still stupid, my boy. Sitnikovs are indispensable to us. For me, don't you understand, I need such blockheads. In fact, it's not for the gods to take bricks. Oh, ho, thought Arkady, and only then he saw in a flash the whole fathomless depth of Bazarov's conceit. So you and I are gods in that case? At least you're a god but I suppose I'm one of the blockheads. Yes, repeated Bazarov gloomily. You're still stupid. Madame Odinstov expressed no particular surprise when Arkady told her the next day that he was going with Bazarov. She seemed tired and preoccupied. Katya looked at them with silent gravity. The princess went so far as to cross herself under her shawl so that he could not help noticing it. But Sitnikov, on the other hand, was most disconcerted. He had just appeared for breakfast in a smart new costume, not this time in the Slavophile fashion, 
The previous evening he had astonished the man appointed to look after him by the quantity of linen he had brought, and now, all of a sudden, his comrades were deserting him. He took a few quick steps, darted round like a hunted hare on the edge of a wood, and abruptly, almost with terror, almost with a wail, he announced that he also proposed to leave. Madame Odenstov made no attempt to detain him. "'My carriage is very comfortable,' added the unlucky young man, turning to Arkady. "'I can take you, while Evgeny Vasilich takes your tarantas, so that will be even more convenient.' "'But really, it's quite off your road, and it's a long way to where I live.' "'Never mind, that's nothing. I've plenty of time. Besides, I have business in that direction.' "'Selling vodka?' asked Arkady, rather too contemptuously. But Sitnikov was already reduced to such despair that he did not even laugh as he usually did. "'I assure you, my carriage is extremely comfortable,' he muttered, "'and there will be room for everyone.' "'Don't upset Monsieur Sitnikov by refusing,' murmured Anna Sergeyevna. Arkady glanced at her and bowed his head significantly. The visitors left after breakfast. As she said good-bye to Bazarov, Madame Odinstov held out her hand to him and said, "'We shall meet again, shan't we?' "'As you command,' answered Bazarov. "'In that case, we shall.' Arkady was the first to go out into the porch, he climbed into Sitnikov's carriage. The butler tucked him in respectfully, but Arkady would gladly have struck him or burst into tears. Bazarov seated himself in the Tarantas. When they reached Koklovsky, Arkady waited till Fedot, the keeper of the posting station, had harnessed the horses. Then, going up to the Tarantas, he said with his old smile to Bazarov, Evgeny, take me with you. I want to come to your place. Get in, muttered Bazarov between his teeth. Sitnikov, who had been walking up and down by the wheels of his carriage, whistling boldly, could only open his mouth and gape when he heard these words, while Arkady coolly pulled his luggage out of the carriage, took his seat beside Bazarov, and, bowing politely to his former traveling companion, shouted, "'Drive off!' The Tarantas rolled away and was soon out of sight. Sitnikov, utterly confused, looked at his coachman, but he was flicking his whip round the tail of the offside horse. Finally, Sitnikov jumped into his carriage, and yelling at two passing peasants, "'Put on your caps, fools!' He drove to the town, where he arrived very late, and where the next day, at Madame Kukshin's, he spoke severely about two disgustingly stuck-up and ignorant fellows. Sitting in the Tarantas alongside Bazarov, Arkady pressed his friend's hand warmly, and for a long time he said nothing. It seemed as though Bazarov appreciated both Arkady's action and his silence. He had not slept at all the previous night, neither had he smoked and for several days he had scarcely eaten anything. His thin profile stood out darkly and sharply from under his cap, which was pulled down over his eyebrows. "'Well, brother,' he said at last, "'give me a cigar. But, look, I say, is my tongue yellow?' "'It's yellow,' answered Arkady. "'Hm, yes, and the cigar has no taste.' The machine is out of gear. "'You have certainly changed lately,' observed Arkady. "'That's nothing. We shall soon recover. One thing bothers me. My mother is so soft-hearted. If your tummy doesn't grow round as a barrel and you don't eat ten times a day, she's in despair. My father's all right. He's been everywhere and known all the ups and downs.' "'No, I can't smoke,' he added, and flung the cigar away into the dusty road. 
Do you think it's another sixteen miles to your place? asked Arkady. Yes, but ask this wise man. He pointed to the peasant sitting on the box, a laborer of Fedot's. But the wise man only answered, Who's to know? Miles aren't measured hereabouts, and went on swearing under his breath at the shaft horse for kicking with her headpiece, by which he meant jerking her head. "'Yes, yes,' began Bazarov. "'It's a lesson for you, my young friend, an instructive example. The devil knows what rubbish it is. Every man hangs by a thread. Any minute the abyss may open under his feet, and yet he must go and invest for himself all kinds of troubles and spoil his life. "'What are you hinting at?' asked Arkady. "'I'm not hinting at anything. I'm saying plainly that we both behaved like fools. What's the use of talking about it? But I've noticed in hospital work, the man who's angry with his illness, he's sure to get over it.' "'I don't quite understand you,' remarked Arkady. "'It seems you have nothing to complain about.' Well, if you don't quite understand me, I'll tell you this. To my mind, it's better to break stones on the road than to let a woman get the mastery of even the end of one's little finger. That's all... Bazarov was about to utter his favorite word, romanticism, but checked himself and said, Rubbish! You won't believe me now, but I'll tell you. You and I fell into feminine society and very nice we found it. But we throw off that sort of society. It's like taking a dip in cold water on a hot day. A man has no time for these trifles. A man must be untamed, says an old Spanish proverb. Now you, my wise friend, he added, addressing the peasant on the box, I suppose you have a wife? The peasant turned his dull, bleary-eyed face towards the two young friends. "'A wife? Yes. How could it be otherwise?' "'Do you beat her?' "'My wife? Anything may happen. We don't beat her without a reason.' "'That's fine. Well, and does she beat you?' The peasant tugged at the reins. "'What things you say, sir?' You like a joke. He was obviously offended. You hear, Arkady Nikolaevich. But we've been properly beaten. That's what comes of being educated people. Arkady gave a forced laugh, while Bazarov turned away and did not open his mouth again for the rest of the journey. Those sixteen miles seemed to Arkady quite like double the distance. But at last, on the slope of some rising ground, the little village where Bazarov's parents lived came into sight. Close to it, in a young birch copse, stood a small house with a thatched roof. Two peasants with their hats on stood near the first hut swearing at each other. "'You're a great swine,' said one. "'You're worse than a little sucking pig.' "'And your wife's a witch,' retorted the other. By their unconstrained behavior, remarked Bazarov to Arkady, and by the playfulness of their phraseology, you can guess that my father's peasants are not overmuch oppressed. But there he is himself coming out on the steps of the house. He must have heard the bells. It's him, all right. I recognize his figure. Aye, aye, only how gray he's grown, poor old chap. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 Bazarov leaned out of the Tarantas, while Arkady stretched out his head from behind his companion's back, and saw standing on the steps of the little house a tall, thinnish man with ruffled hair and a sharp aquiline nose, dressed in an old military coat, not buttoned up. He stood with his legs wide apart, smoking a long pipe, and screwing up his eyes to keep the sun out of them. The horses stopped. 
"'Arrived at last!' exclaimed Bizarro's father, still continuing to smoke, though the pipe was fairly jumping up and down between his fingers. "'Come, get out, get out, let me hug you!' He began embracing his son. "'And Yusha, and Yusha resounded a woman's quavering voice. The door flew open, and on the threshold appeared a plump little old woman in a white cap and short colored jacket. She cried, staggered, and would probably have fallen if Bazarov had not supported her. Her plump little hands were instantly twined around his neck, her head was pressed to his breast, and there followed a complete hush, only interrupted by the sound of her broken sobs. Old Bazarov breathed hard and screwed up his eyes more than before. "'There, that's enough, enough, Arisha, leave off,' he said, exchanging a look with Arkady, who remained standing motionless by the tarantas, while even the peasant on the box turned his head away. "'That's quite unnecessary. Please leave off.' "'Ah, Vasily Ivanitch,' faltered the old woman, "'for what ages, my dear one, my darling, Enyushenka? And without unclasping her hands, she drew back her wrinkled face, wet with tears, and overwhelmed with tenderness, and looked at him with blissful and somehow comic eyes, and then again fell on his neck. "'Well, yes, of course, that's all in the nature of things.' remarked Vasily Ivanitch. Only we had better come indoors. Here's a visitor arrived with Evgeny. You must excuse this, he added, turning to Arkady and slightly scraping the ground with his foot. You understand a woman's weakness and, well, a mother's heart. His own lips and eyebrows were quivering and his chin shook but obviously he was trying to master his feelings and to appear almost indifferent. Arkady bowed. "'Let's go in, mother, really,' said Bazarov, and he led the enfeebled old woman into the house. He put her in a comfortable armchair, once more hurriedly embraced his father, and introduced Arkady to him. "'Heartily glad to make your acquaintance,' said Vasily Ivanitch. But you mustn't expect anything grand. We live very simply here, like military people. Arina Vlasyevna, pray calm yourself. What faint-heartedness! Our guest will think ill of you. My good sir, said the old woman through her tears, I haven't the honor of knowing your name and your father's. Arkady Nikolaevich interposed Vasily Ivanitch solemnly, in a low voice. "'Excuse a foolish old woman like me.' She blew her nose, and, bending her head from left to right, she carefully wiped one eye after the other. "'You must excuse me. I really thought I should die, that I should not live to see again my darling.' "'Well, and here we have lived to see him again, madam.' put in Vasily Ivanovich. Tanyushka, he said, turning to a bare-legged little girl of thirteen in a bright red cotton dress, who was shyly peeping in at the door. Bring your mistress a glass of water, on a tray, do you hear? And you, gentlemen, he added with a kind of old-fashioned playfulness, allow me to invite you into the study of a retired veteran. "'Just once more let me embrace you, Enyushka, groaned Arina Vlasyevna. Bazarov bent down to her. "'Gracious, how handsome you've grown!' "'Well, I don't know about being handsome,' remarked Vasily Ivanovich. "'But he's a man, as the saying goes. Omfe. "'And now, I hope, Arina Vlasyevna, having satisfied your maternal heart, you will turn your thoughts to satisfying the appetites of our dear guests, because, as you know, even nightingales can't be fed on fairy tales. The old lady rose from her chair. 
This very minute, Vasily Ivanovich, the table shall be laid. I will myself run to the kitchen and order the samovar to be brought in. Everything will be ready, everything. Why, for three whole years I have not seen him, have not been able to give him food or drink. Is that nothing? Well, you see to things, little hostess. Bustle about. Don't put us to shame. And you, gentlemen, I beg you to follow me. Here is Timofetch come to pay his respects to you, Evgeny. And the old dog, I dare say he too is delighted. Aye, aren't you delighted, old dog? Be so good as to follow me. And Vasily Ivanovich went bustling ahead, shuffling and flapping with his down-at-heel slippers. His whole house consisted of six tiny rooms. One of these, the one into which he led our friends, was called the study. A thick-legged table, littered with papers blackened by an ancient accumulation of dust as if they had been smoked, occupied the whole space between the two windows. On the walls hung Turkish firearms, whips, a saber, two maps, some anatomical diagrams, a portrait of Hufeland, a monogram woven out of hair in a blackened frame, and a diploma under glass. A leather sofa, torn and worn hollow in places, stood between two huge cupboards of Karelian birchwood. On the shelves, books, little boxes, stuffed birds, jars, and vials were crowded together in confusion. In one corner lay a broken electric battery. "'I warned you, my dear guest,' began Vasily Ivanovich, "'that we live, so to speak, bivouacking.' "'Now stop that. What are you apologizing for?' Bazarov interrupted. "'Kirsanov knows very well that we're not Croesuses and that you don't live in a palace. "'Where are we going to put him? That's the question.' To be sure, Evgeny, there's an excellent room in the little wing. He will be very comfortable there. So you've had a wing built on? Of course, where the bathroom is, put in Timofitch. That is, next to the bathroom, Vasily Ivanovich added hurriedly. It's summer now. I will run over there at once and arrange things. And you, Timofeitch. Bring in their luggage, meanwhile. Of course, I hand over my study to you, Evgeny. Tsuam Sik. There you have him, a most comical old chap and very good-natured, remarked Bazarov as soon as Vasily Ivanovich had gone. Just as queer a fish as yours, only in a different way. He chatters too much. And your mother seems a wonderful woman, remarked Arkady. Yes, there's no humbug about her. You just see what a dinner she'll give us. They weren't expecting you today, sir. They've not brought any beef, observed Timofitch, who was just dragging in Bazarov's trunk. We shall manage all right, even without beef. You can't squeeze water from a stone. Poverty, they say, is no crime. How many serfs has your father? asked Arkady suddenly. The property is not his, but mother's. There are fifteen serfs, if I remember. Twenty-two in all, added Timofitch in a dissatisfied tone. The shuffling of slippers was heard, and Vasily Ivanovich reappeared. In a few minutes your room will be ready to receive you, he exclaimed triumphantly. Arkady! Nikolaish, I think that's how I should call you. And here is your servant, he added, indicating a boy with close-cropped hair who had come in with him, wearing a long blue caftan with holes in the elbows and a pair of boots which did not belong to him. His name is Fedka. I repeat again, though my son has forbidden it, you must not expect anything grand. But this fellow knows how to fill a pipe. You smoke, of course? I prefer to smoke cigars, answered Arkady. 
And you're quite right there. I like cigars myself, but in these remote parts it is extremely difficult to get them. Enough crying poverty, interrupted Bazarov. You had better sit down on the sofa here and let us have a look at you. Vasily Ivanovich laughed and sat down. His face was very much like his son's, only his brow was lower and narrower, his mouth rather wider, and he never stopped making restless movements, shrugged his shoulders as though his coat cut him under the armpits, blinked, cleared his throat and gesticulated with his fingers, whereas his son's most striking characteristic was the nonchalant immobility of his manner. "'Crying poverty!' repeated Vasily Ivanovich. You must suppose, Evgeny, that I want our guest, so to speak, to take pity on us by making out that we live in such a wilderness. On the contrary, I maintain that for a thinking man there is no such thing as a wilderness. At least I try, as far as possible, not to grow rusty, so to speak, not to fall behind the times. Vasily Ivanovich drew out of his pocket a new yellow silk handkerchief, which he had found time to snatch up when he ran over to Arkady's room, and flourishing it in the air, he went on, I am not speaking now of the fact that I, for instance, at the cost of quite considerable sacrifices to myself, have put my peasants on the rent system and given up my land to them in return for half the proceeds. I considered it my duty. Common sense alone demands that it should be done, though other landowners don't even think about doing it. But I speak now of the sciences, of education. Yes, I see you have here the Friend of Health for 1855, remarked Pizarro. That was sent me by an old comrade as a friendly gesture, Vasily Ivanovich hastily announced. But we have, for instance, some idea even of phrenology, he added, addressing himself principally to Arkady, and pointing out a small plaster head on the cupboard, divided into numbered squares. Even Schönlein is not unknown to us, and Rademacher. Do people still believe in Rademacher in this province? inquired Bazarov. Vasily Ivanovich cleared his throat. In this province, of course, gentlemen, you know better. How could we keep pace with you? You are here to take our places. Even in my time, there was a so-called humoralist Hoffman, and a certain Brown with his vitalism. They seemed very ridiculous to us, but they, too, had great reputations at one time. Someone new has taken Rademacher's place with you, you bow down to him, but in another twenty years it will probably be his turn to be laughed at. For your consolation I can tell you, said Bazarov, that we nowadays laugh at medicine altogether and bow down to nobody. How do you mean? Surely you want to be a doctor? Yes, but the one doesn't prevent the other. Vasily Ivanovich poked his middle finger into his pipe, where a little smoldering ash was left. Well, perhaps, perhaps, I'm not going to dispute. What am I? A retired army doctor. Voila, too. And now farming has fallen to my lot. I served in your grandfather's brigade, he addressed himself to Arkady again. Yes, yes, I have seen many sights in my time, and I mixed with every kind of society. I, myself, the man you see before you, have felt the pulse of Prince Wittgenstein and of Zukovsky. They were in the Southern Army, the 14th, you understand. And here Vasily Ivanovich pursed his lips significantly. I knew them all inside out. Well, well, but my work was only on one side. Stick to your lancet and be content. Your grandfather was a very honorable man and a real soldier. 
"'Confess, he was a regular blockhead,' remarked Bazarov lazily. "'Ah, Evgeny, how can you use such an expression? Do consider. Of course, General Kirsanov was not one of those—' "'Well, drop him,' interrupted Bazarov. "'As I was driving along, I was pleased to see your birch plantation. It has sprung up admirably.' Vasily Ivanovich brightened. "'And you must see the little garden I've got now. I planted every tree myself. I have fruit, raspberries, and all kind of medicinal herbs. However much you young gentlemen may know, old Paracelsa spoke the sacred truth. In herbis, verbis et lapidibus. I've retired from practice, as you know, but at least twice a week something happens to bring me back to my old work. They come for advice. I can't drive them away. And sometimes the poor people need help. Indeed, there are no doctors here at all. One of the neighbors here, a retired major, just imagine it, he doctors the people too. I ask the question, has he studied medicine? They answer, no, he hasn't studied. He does it more from philanthropy. Ha-ha! <laughs> from philanthropy! What do you think of that? Ha-ha! <laughs> Fedka, fill me a pipe, said Bazarov sternly. And there's another doctor here who had just visited a patient, continued Vasily Ivanovich in a kind of desperation. But the patient had already gone ad patres. The servant wouldn't let the doctor in, and tells him, You're no longer needed. He never expected this, got confused, and asked, Well, did your master hiccup before he died? Yes. Did he hiccup much? Yes. Ah, well, that's all right. And off he went again. <laughs> the old man laughed alone. Arkady managed to show a smile on his face. Bazarov merely stretched himself. The conversation continued in this way for about an hour. Arkady found time to go to his room, which turned out to be the anteroom to the bathroom, but it was very cozy and clean. At last Tanyushka came in and announced that dinner was ready. Vasily Ivanovich was the first to get up. Come, gentlemen, you must pardon me generously if I have bored you. Maybe my good wife will give you better satisfaction. The dinner, though hastily prepared, was very good and even abundant. Only the wine was not quite up to the mark. It was sherry, almost black, bought by Timofesh in the town from a well-known merchant, and it had a flavor of copper or resin. The flies also were a nuisance. On ordinary days a surf boy used to keep driving them away with a big green branch, but on this occasion Vasily Ivanovich had sent him away for fear of adverse criticism from the younger generation. Arina Vlasyevna had changed her dress and was wearing a high cap with silk ribbons and a pale blue flowered shawl. She started crying again as soon as she caught sight of her Enyusha, but her husband did not need to admonish her. She herself made haste to dry her tears in order not to spoil her shawl. Only the young men ate. The host and hostess had both dined long ago. Fedka waited at table, obviously encumbered by his unfamiliar boots. He was helped by a woman with a masculine cast of face and one eye, called Anfashushka. She fulfilled the duties of housekeeper, poultry woman, and laundress. Vasily Ivanovich walked up and down throughout the dinner, and with a perfectly contented and even blissful face, talked about the grave anxieties he had felt about Napoleon's policy and the complications of the Italian question. Arina Vlasyevna took no notice of Arkady, and did not press him to eat. Leaning her round face on her little fist, 
her full cherry-colored lips and the little moles on her cheeks and over her eyebrows, adding to her extremely kind, good-natured expression, she did not take her eyes off her son and constantly sighed. She was dying to know for how long he would stay, but she was afraid to ask him. "'What if he stays for two days?' she thought, and her heart sank. After the roast, Vasily Ivanovich disappeared for a moment and returned with an opened half-bottle of champagne. "'Here!' he exclaimed. "'Though we do live in the wilds, we have something to make merry with on festive occasions.' He poured out three full glasses and a little wine-glass, proposed the health of our invaluable guests, and at once tossed off his glass in military fashion and made Arlina Vlasyevna drink her wine-glass to the last drop. When the time came for the sweet preserves, Arkady, who could not bear anything sweet, thought it his duty, however, to taste four different kinds which had been freshly made, all the more since Bazarov flatly refused them and began at once to smoke a cigar. Afterwards, tea was served with cream, butter, and rolls. Then Vasily Ivanovich took them all out into the garden to admire the beauty of the evening. As they passed a garden seat, he whispered to Arkady, "'This is the spot where I love to meditate as I watch the sunset. It suits a recluse like me. And there, a little farther off, I have planted some of the trees beloved by Horace. "'What trees?' asked Bazarov, overhearing. "'Oh, acacias!' Bazarov began to yawn. "'I suppose it is time our travelers were in the embrace of Morpheus,' observed Vasily Ivanovich. "'In other words, it's time for bed,' Bazarov interposed. "'That's a correct judgment. It certainly is high time.' Saying good night to his mother, he kissed her on the forehead while she embraced him, and secretly, behind his back, she gave him her blessing three times. Vasily Ivanovich showed Arkady to his room, and wished him as refreshing repose as I also enjoyed at your happy years. In fact, Arkady slept extremely well in his bathhouse. It smelt of mint and two crickets behind the stove rivaled each other in their prolonged drowsy chirping. Vasily Ivanovich went from Arkady's room to his own study, and, settling down on the sofa at his son's feet, was looking forward to having a chat with him. But Bazarov sent him away at once, saying he felt sleepy. But he did not fall asleep till morning. With wide-open eyes, he stared angrily into the darkness. Memories of childhood had no power over him, and besides, he had not yet been able to rid himself of the impression of his recent bitter experiences. Arina Vlasyevna first prayed to her heart's content, then she had a long, long conversation with Antasushka, who stood rooted to the spot in front of her mistress and, fixing her solitary eye upon her, communicated in a mysterious whisper all her observations and conjectures about Evgeny Vasilovich. The old lady's head was giddy with happiness, wine, and tobacco smoke. Her husband tried to talk to her, but with a wave of the hand he gave it up. Arina Vlasyevna was a genuine Russian lady of olden times. She ought to have lived two centuries before, in the ancient Moscow days. She was very devout and emotional. She believed in fortune-telling, charms, dreams and omens of every conceivable kind. She believed in the prophecies of crazy people, in house spirits, in wood spirits, in unlucky meetings, in the evil eye, in popular remedies. She ate specially prepared salt on Holy Thursday, and believed that the end of the world was close at hand. 
She believed that if on Easter Sunday the candles did not go out at Vespers, then there would be a good crop of buckwheat, and that a mushroom will not grow after a human eye has seen it. She believed that the devil likes to be where there is water, and that every Jew has a blood-stained spot on his breast. She was afraid of mice, of snakes, of frogs, of sparrows, of leeches, of thunder, of cold water, of draughts, of horses, of goats, of red-haired people, and of black cats. She regarded crickets and dogs as unclean animals. She never ate veal, pigeon, crayfish, cheese, asparagus, Jerusalem artichokes, hares, or watermelons, because a cut watermelon suggested the head of John the Baptist. She could not speak of oysters without a shudder. She enjoyed eating, but strictly observed fasts. She slept ten hours out of the twenty-four, and never went to bed at all if Vasily Ivanovich had so much as a headache. She had never read a single book except Alexis or The Cottage in the Forest. She wrote one, or at most, two letters in a year, but she was an expert housewife, knew all about preserving and jam-making, though she touched nothing with her own hands, and was usually reluctant to move from her place. Arina Vlasyevna was very kind-hearted, and in her own way far from stupid. She knew that the world is divided into masters whose duty it is to command, and simple people whose duty it is to serve, and so she felt no disgust for servile behavior or bowing to the ground, but she treated affectionately and gently those in subjection to her, never let a single beggar go away empty-handed, and never spoke ill of anyone, though she was fond of gossip. In her youth she had been very pretty, had played the clavichord and spoken a little French, but in the course of many years of wandering with her husband, whom she had married against her will, she had grown stout and forgotten both music and French. Her son she loved and feared unutterably. She had handed over the management of her little estate to Vasily Ivanovich, and she no longer took any part in it. She would groan, wave her handkerchief, and raise her eyebrows higher and higher in horror directly her old husband began to discuss impending land reforms and his own plans. She was apprehensive, always expecting some great calamity, and would weep at once whenever she remembered anything sad. Nowadays such women have almost ceased to exist. God knows whether this should be a cause for rejoicing. End of chapter 20